can you do a video about the legal tests in a homeless application process and what order they're done in? Now this is a question that's coming from the YouTube comment section, a really good one. Uh, and basically what I'm going to try and do is explain what these tests are and also talk about some of the myths that are associated with them and crucially what order they're done in because the order they're done in actually makes a big difference to people depending on what their circumstances are. So there's five tests within a homeless application process. Whether you're homeless, whether you're eligible, whether you're in priority need, whether you have local connection and whether you're intentionally homeless or not. And depending on which tests you pass will define what, what duties the council have to you. Now, essentially, if you pass all five of the tests, or certainly four of them, local connection isn't actually necessary technically. But if you pass all those tests, the council will owe you what's called the main homelessness duty or the main housing duty, which is where they have a duty to make sure you end up with settled accommodation. And that could be private rented, but decent quality private rented, or it could be housing in the social kind of social housing sector, so whether it's council housing or a housing association. But there are actually housing duties to, to people who don't pass all five tests. So for example, if you're homeless, eligible and in priority need, but you're intentionally homeless, the council would still have to house you for maybe three or four months before they can end their duty to you. And there are lesser duties as well. So for example, if you're homeless but you're not in priority need, the council would still have to help you try to find alternative accommodation. So again, I'm gonna talk about more of these as we go through. So the first two tests you can actually approach in either order, but when I do the training online and when I, when I train teams around the country, I do them in, in, the, in the order I've just given. So the first question is whether the person's homeless. Um, and what you'll find is that with each of these tests there's kind of sub tests or sub questions or sub criteria that kind of help you define what the answer to that question is so with homelessness there are basically four different criteria in which someone would be homeless and it could be either of them it doesn't have to be all of them um, and the first one and this again is how i do it when i when i do my training because it makes it makes sense to do it this way the first one is whether you are threatened with homelessness. So that would be where it's likely you're going to be homeless within the next 56 days. So it might be, for example, you've been given a, a valid notice to quit by your landlord, or it might be you've been in hospital for a long time and you're about to be discharged, or it might be you've been in prison and you're about to be released within 56 days. So you can approach a council within that 56 day period. The point is that you don't have to wait until you're actually homeless before the council can help. And if you're approaching that 56 day period, something called the prevention duty kicks in, where the council's job is to try their best to prevent you from becoming homeless. But often it doesn't work because you know uh, lots of landlords want to evict people and, and so on. Um, and so you've then got these three remaining tests. The first is kind of the most obvious, where you don't have a legal right to occupy anywhere in the world. Um, and, and it might seem like a weird thing to say that anywhere in the world, but it does kind of come into different situations where you see people who actually, they have got a house in their home country um, and therefore they're not homeless. Again, we'll kind of see a bit more on that in a minute. So that's kind of the obvious one. But you have also got people who have a home but it's not available to them. So that might be because the landlords uh, changed the locks illegally, or it might be because they've got a caravan, but they've got nowhere to legally berth it. And as I said already, it might be because they've got accommodation in another, in another country, but they don't have the money to pay for an airfare to get back there. So in that case, councils will quite often be able to pay the airfare in order for that person to be able to access their housing. That's the second of these three actual homeless categories. The third one is the one which is the most relevant to the most number of people. And that's where you have accommodation, but it's not reasonable to continue to occupy that accommodation indefinitely. And that covers people who are at risk of domestic abuse or other abuse. It would cover people who, for example, literally genuinely can't afford their rent. Um, and therefore, it's not reasonable to continue to occupy the accommodation indefinitely. And it would also cover people who uh, maybe they have a medical condition or a mobility issue, which means that actually they can't make use of the property in the way they need to. So, for example, their their bathing facilities might be upstairs and they, they're a wheelchair user, they can't get up the stairs. And, and in that situation is, is one of the many ways in which you don't have to, the council wouldn't have to rehouse you. It might be that they can get an OT to come in and actually you know put a stair lift in or something like that in order to make that property reasonable to continue to occupy. So that's a very, real whistle stop tour of the definition of homelessness or that, that, that kind of test on homelessness. And again, lots of the myths you get here, lots of housing officers don't pick up on the fact that you know, you might not be threatened with homelessness yet, but it may already be unreasonable to continue to occupy because of, for example, you can't afford the rent. That's something which often happens where actually councils could do a lot more to people or for people in that situation. So that's the first test. 
The second test is eligibility, and again, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but there's basically three categories, and again, three subcategories of people or, or situations in which people would not would be eligible. Um, and it's probably easy to approach them in the negative. So you would not be eligible if you are subject to immigration control or if you are not a habitual resident in the country, and that would potentially apply to British nationals who have been living in Spain for 20 years and have just returned. Um, and it would also apply to people whose right to live in the UK comes from their job seeker status. Now, again, one myth of many here is that you know you can't, you won't pass the habitual residency test until you've been in the country for six months. If you look in the code of guidance, the very last annex of it talks about this idea. Actually, you know, a British national returning from Spain would potentially only need to live here for a month before they can actually qualify as, as having habitual residency status, and therefore would be eligible to you know to, to get assistance through the Housing Act. Another thing just to mention here is that even if you're definitely not eligible for assistance, the council can still give you advice and, and some help around you know what your options are. It may be I've seen councils, for example, pay for an airfare back to a, your home country where you've got accommodation, or it may be that um, you know they, they give you information about different accommodation projects which you don't need to have recourse to public funds in order to access them. So those are the first two tests. And going back slightly, if you approach a council and you give a council reason to believe that you might be homeless, so either threatened with homelessness or under those other three categories, the council has to accept the application and they have to carry out inquiries to work out what other duties are owed to you. So one of those kind of questions I'll be asking at that point is whether you're eligible for assistance. Um, and the third big one at this stage is whether there's reason to believe that you might be in priority need. And again, you can break priority need down into subcategories or subcriteria. So there's essentially six situations in which you'd automatically be in priority need, which would be pregnancy. And it, again, one of the myths is you've got to be 16 weeks pregnant before you qualify. That's nonsense. If you're pregnant, you're in priority need. If your household or, or the applicant has dependent children in the household, if you are homeless as a result of domestic abuse, you're automatically in priority need. If you are 16 or 17 years old and have already gone through the Children Act, Appro um, Children Act assessment and have turned that support down, you'd automatically be in priority need. And there's quite a complicated one around uh, 18 to 20 year old care leavers, which again, if you want more detail on that, you need to look in the Code of Guidance. It's in Chapter 6. Uh, sorry, Chapter 8. And so, and the final one of the automatic criteria is where you've been homeless or you've been made homeless as a result of fire or flood or other natural disaster. So those are the automatic categories of priority need. You've also got this really complicated concept of vulnerability. So, and it kind of lists some examples of situations in which you would be vulnerable or you would be in priority need if you're vulnerable as a result of them. So, for example, serving in the armed forces, uh, you might be vulnerable as a result of historic domestic abuse or modern slavery or human trafficking, exploitation, those sorts of things. Uh, disabilities, mental, physical health issues, those kind of things, old age potentially, potentially young age as well actually. And things like uh, being institutionalised in, in care or in prison, those sorts of things. And there's kind of a catch-all with this as well, which kind of covers anything that the list doesn't cover. So it could be all sorts of random situations you find people um, have suffered some kind of trauma. or it's, it's often kind of centred around trauma, to be honest. So that's kind of priority need. And this is where I'm going to try my best, but this gets a bit complicated. If there's reason to, so you've made a homeless application, you've given the council reasons to believe you might be homeless and um, you've asked them for help for housing, so you've triggered section 184. As I say, the council then look at these next three tests and if there's reason to believe you might be homeless, might be eligible, might be in priority need, the council has to make temporary accommodation available to you. You could technically call it interim accommodation at this point. It's in that interim period where the council's carrying out the wider assessment and they're working out actually whether you, you actually are in priority need or whether you actually are homeless. But, um, so that's kind of the idea of it. Now at this point, the relief duties kicked in. So you're actually homeless, you know, you're not you're not threatened with homelessness, you're actually homeless, you've made the homeless application, you're in temporary accommodation now. The council can start looking at local connection and intentional homelessness at, the, at this point, but they can't actually issue a, an intentional homelessness decision within that 56 day period. So they can tell you, look, you know, Mike, we think you're intentionally homeless, just factor that into your plans and what you're going to do, but they can't actually issue that decision yet. But what they can do is they can issue a decision which says I'm not in priority need or I'm not homeless or I'm not eligible for assistance. So let's say, you know, I went in and I said, you know, I've got some mental health issues and they carried out some inquiries with a GP and they may legitimately conclude that actually, you know, there was reason to believe I might have been in priority need because of my diagnoses, but they've talked to my GP or treating professionals and actually, you know, my GP might say, well, actually, Mike's really, you know, doing really well. He's really robust at the moment. You know, his, his, you know, his, his mental health issues are not causing any concern at the moment. In that case, they could legitimately reach a decision that I'm not in priority need. 
and they can issue that decision within 56 days. So I'm in temporary accommodation, you know, day one, day two, they get a, get the, uh, the feedback from the GP and they could legitimately conclude that I'm not in priority need and therefore they would only have to continue to uh, accommodate me in temporary accommodation for a reasonable period of time, which is often just a matter of days, you know, maybe seven days, that's what they do in Bedford. It's not set in stone what that day, that period has to be. So I've got time to make other arrangements, basically. And equally, you know, if I said that I'd been evicted, or you know, I've been evicted by the landlord, and actually the council looked at the eviction and said this is not a valid notice or something like that, or it hasn't been done properly, then you know, again, they could issue a not homeless decision at that point within that 56-day period. But as I say, intentional homelessness doesn't come in yet. But what does come in at this stage is local connection. So we've, we've talked about the first three tests. The next test is local connection. It's important to say that councils don't actually have to look at local connection at all. It's just it's basically a choice. Although realistically, they have to defend their resources, so you know they they are legit you know, within their rights to look at local connection at this point. And if you don't have local connection to that council, and you do have local connection to a different council, and it's safe to be there, and if the connection's through family associates, then you actually positively want to live with those you know near those family associates. The council can formally refer you to that other area. And, and note that it's not the same thing as saying, oi well, Mike, you don't have local connection here, you need to go to that other council. They would have to put me in, you know, they'd have to accept the application. If there's reason to believe I might be homeless, might be eligible, might be in priority need, they'd have to put me in temporary accommodation for a good few days. They then contact that other council, and really the, the other council, you know, unless they, they're aware of some safety concerns or something, they can't really turn that or that referral down. But as I say, it's a different thing from you know just gatekeeping me and, and fobbing me off and sending me to a different council, as opposed to actually formally going through the right mechanisms and making that referral you know uh, legitimately. So local connection can kick in there. Local connection can also kick in once the councils reach their final decision. So if the council if the council finish their inquiries and they're satisfied that I am homeless, I am eligible, I am in priority needs, uh, I'm not homeless intentionally then they can at that point again refer me back to a local authority where I do have local connection assuming that I don't have local connection to that local authority and uh, you know as I say I've, I've done other videos which talks about this in more detail but again they don't have to but again that other council doesn't really have an option so there's this kind of weird situation where the you know another council might have found me intentionally homeless but then I approach this council they say actually I'm not intentionally homeless they could refer me back once they've accepted the main homelessness duty and that other council can't say no to that referral you know they can challenge it through judicial review or whatever but they're very unlikely to do that so that's the that's the that that um that fourth test of local connection and then finally we get back to intentional homelessness so in that 56 day relief period they can look into it but they can't issue a decision yet on the 57th day they could issue a decision to say mike you're homeless we're satisfied that you're homeless we're satisfied you're eligible we're satisfied you're in priority need we're satisfied you have local connection but we're also satisfied that you became homeless intentionally and Again, I've done videos on this as well. There's lots of myths around intentional homelessness. Lots of housing officers will see rent arrears on my record or something like that and assume that I'm all automatically intentionally homeless. It's, it's not true. It's very easy to challenge. But at that point, so in, I'm homeless and I'm in priority need. They're the key things here. The council still has that duty to provide accommodation for a, a period of time that gives me a reasonable prospect to find something else, which is typically 28 days. But if I don't have any other options, you know, genuinely, then it would potentially have to be longer. So I think that's all I want to say about the five part test for now. Hopefully that gives you an overview and, and kind of hopefully helps make sense of the other videos I've done to work out what, you know, how it all fits together. Um, but yeah, keep the questions coming in the YouTube comment section. Again, if it's a question which I can answer, I will try my best to check out our online training um, and our, you know, our actual day courses in-house. In, in so um, at the moment, as it happens, I'm traveling to Southampton to deliver training there tomorrow. I've got uh, dates in Somerset coming in and, and, and there's other, other dates in the pipeline as well. So um, this is the kind of stuff we cover in the training, but obviously there's the possibilities of asking, you know, kind of lots of questions as we go. So yeah, um, as I say, hopefully that helps. 